Hey, I'm Brian Colbert, um, and uh, this is this is a bit of perspective on the rare disease ecosystem. Um, and it's, it's it's kind of perfect that, that Dr. Mozapar went just before because I think this is we're going to have some interesting discussion about um, two different views on the same on the same pieces of information, um, and then and the need to have these kind of open and, and, and clear dialogues to, to to push progress forward. Um, so a quick background. Uh, I'm 34 years old, uh, born and raised in Los Angeles. Um, I was diagnosed with Pompe disease just over three years ago. Um, these are my mutations, as, as we learned earlier. The, uh, the one on the left is a super common late onset uh, mutation. Um, thanks, Mom, uh, for that one. Uh, and then the, the, the one on the right is, is more, more commonly associated with a pretty severe onset infantile uh, location, uh, uh, mutation. Um, and again, um, much like most of my life, strength, strength uh, to mom is, is the important factor here because uh, I'm, I'm doing pretty, pretty well. Um, one of the things that, that even though my diagnosis was pretty recent is that I've, I've been symptomatic since early childhood and this is um, something that, that we, can, we can look back on with reflection and, and objectively um, identify. Um, the same week that I got diagnosed, I also, we were also uh, converting old family videos to DVD and uh, one of them is my, my kindergarten graduation, and, and all the other kids are walking up these like little teeny stairs to, to get up to the stage, and I'm, and I'm waddling up there, uh, pushing off my leg to, to get up the next step, um, and then some, some videos of playing hockey uh, when, I was, when I was a kid too. So, um, you know, at least since, since, since a few years old, some symptoms. A um, couple things about my interest and how I spend my time. Um, so, working to secure the future of humanity, is about the most ridiculous way I could think of to say what I do for a living. Um, I, I work, uh, but this is, but it's also true. Um, I work for a guy who, who is so nerdy that uh, having a backup of his computer, um, a backup hard drive of, of his computer isn't enough. He wants to have a, a backup of human species um, by, by developing planetary uh, life, or sorry, human life on other, on other planets. Um, and there's, there's some, some, some interesting things that we learn about this, this world. Um, uh, of tech and aerospace that, that I think we can really apply towards um, towards medical. Um, I also, uh, in, in my in my spare time, uh, into property management. Um, I, I've got a fourplex downtown that I that I that I live in and, and work on and, and do do a lot of the work and kind of have a lot of fun doing different projects around there and, and dealing with uh, tenants and, and whatnot. Um, and then in the last three years, getting a lot more into this this rare disease stuff. Um, and then finally, uh, sort of the, the thing, only thing on there that actually resembles anything fun is, is I enjoy sports. Um, hockey is my favorite sport, but I really like uh, yeah, a lot, a lot of sports for, for different reasons. And, and big supporter of any LA team. Um, funny story about my, my diagnosis is the, the first time I saw a neurologist um, in 2014, May or, or sorry, March of 2014. Um, walked in there the first time, and she's like, yep, you absolutely have some sort of muscular dystrophy. And I said, oh, they had a joke that that's why I didn't go pro in hockey. And, and she kind of very stoically said, yeah, it would be impossible with some, for somebody with your condition to go professional in sports. Um, it was sort of at that moment that I, that I realized that, uh, that things were a little bit more serious, um, but, but that, that it was important not to take it that way um, and to kind of stay positive about it. Um, so now specifically my thoughts on having Pompeii. Um, so it's, it's, been, it's, been, it's been interesting. I, I understand a lot of my experiences growing up much better now than I did. Um, I only learned what Pompeii was uh, three years ago, um, but, but it's really, uh, even before knowing about it, it's, it's a big part of who I have become. Um, and, and, and I'm grateful for that. Um, I get sad occasionally, but more than anything, it's been really great. Uh, so this is this is really strange to say, but but hopefully um, I can I can convince you guys. And if you if you don't feel the same way by the end of this, I can convince you guys that, that this is actually a pretty cool thing. Um, as I as I as I sort of jumped into various roles throughout my process of, of coming to terms with everything, um, I've learned that I'm far more interested in rare disease as a whole than I am specifically in Pompeii. Um, but I think that, that Pompeii has an important role to play in progress for rare disease as a whole. Um, so this is something like, uh, you know, think globally, act globally, I guess. 
Um, and I'm very excited about the future and motivated to amplify the cumulative effort to get there faster. Um, this is important for Pompeii, but also for rare disease as a whole. Um, and so a quick aside on this, because because speed and pace of progress is something that's going to be a recurring theme um, that I, that I want to bring from my, my professional background um, into uh, to, to this background a little bit. Um, so if we, if we believe that the future holds some sense of greatness and some sense of, of, of something really wonderful uh, for us, then why wouldn't we have an urgency and an excitement to accelerate our progress to get there? Um, that is different, and, and, and subtly but importantly so, than, uh, than, than cutting corners or, or being impatient. Um, and it's also different than, uh, it, and it's also not to say that we shouldn't appreciate where we're at today. Um, and, and kind of look around and enjoy uh, our current lives, right? Um, but, but some of these things we should really look forward to, to accelerating um, every way that we can. Um, so my other thought on Pompeii, and this is this is this slide's probably, um, yeah. Hopefully, I explain it well enough because it's pretty central to, to my, my 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 feelings about it. Um, we're super fortunate. Um, we are very fortunate. Um, not only in, in any given disease, but, but especially in a rare disease, that we have so many folks with palm pain treatments in their pipelines. Um, and I think there's, there's nine, by my count, of, of folks with, with, that, that I know about, and I'm sure there's, there's, there's more with earlier stages um, of treatments in their pipeline. Um, but it's not luck that got us here. Uh, and this is an important thing that I think um, new patients getting diagnosed, um, we can kind of get overwhelmed with, and, and, and the uh, prevalence of the information that is that is most readily available um, suggests uh, a story that got us here that is that is an interpretation of the truth, but perhaps not the entire um, uh, perspective on it. Um, but but in summary, we got here because heroes got us here um, and, and, and carried us in some really uh, I get choked up uh, some really extraordinary uh, impressive people brought us here. So off on the chart here we're. Let's say, let's start the story in, 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 in 1900, 1901, when, when um, Dr. Dr. Pompeo was born. He wasn't a doctor yet, but, but, uh, but he was born. <laughs> um, and, then, and, and then even before that, I mean, Pompeo's it, sort of an interesting thing. I, I not only just learned this recently, but um, some form of this disease is actually uh, uh, prevalent in, in, in animal kingdom and, and, and species that come far before humanity. So. Um, in, in, a, in a absolutely historical context, an evolutionary context, um, we're, we're absolutely not alone. Um, but, but 1900, and a quick thing on, on, on Pompeii, um, super, super rock star dude. He, uh, he, he categorized our disease, he uh, fought the Nazis, and he died doing so. Uh, I guess are sort of three, three quick things. Um, life cut short, but, but we, we thank him for first characterizing Pompeii disease. Um, then for, for, for 90 years, well, I guess 60 years from, from when he died, um, there wasn't a whole lot of progress, um, to, to, be, to be quite frank. Um, in the mid-90s, the, the right group of people um, got touched by the disease um, and, 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 uh, and took that as a call to action. Um, so really from the mid-90s on, uh, there was a, a, a dramatically different level of of activity in, in racing towards the treatment for Pompeii disease, and, and really even an understanding of what the disease was and how it happened. Um, I'll, I'll provide a link to anybody who hasn't read it, but that, that goes through uh, in, a, in a bit of a journalistic pain, but but a, but a, a great account of, of that whole part of the story. Um, no ERT, no concept that ERT would even would even work uh, in the mid '90s to uh, to ten years later. ERT is approved uh, by the FDA, um, the, the EMA, the, so Europe's version of it, and so on. And, and we've been seeing treatments, or seeing patients uh, in studies for, for about five, six years before that at least. Um, we're now in 2018, as, as I think most of us know, um, and we're still benefiting and learning a lot about, about the benefits of, of, of lumazine and myozyme. Um, and, and ERT, and, and as, as we mentioned before, a whole flurry of activity. So we're, we're, we're working our way up this hill for next generation ERTs and gene therapies and gene editing and, and all these things that are, that are gonna provide a level of cure. Um, but there's an important perspective that we can take from, from, from these heroes that started here. Um, when you're standing in front of, in, in front of this, this, this challenge, uh, it's really tough to know with, 
the, if, if the thing that you see in front of you is actually the top of the mountain, or, or that there lies a peak further beyond that. Um, and I think that, that there's a little bit of, 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 of truth to that in our experience. Um, the, the level of excitement, the, the, the motivation in, behind the RT um, was huge. Um, and now we see today that there's, there's waning, waning uh, uh, sort of praise about it. And we've, we've learned that there is a plateau and there's an absolute need for further, for further meaningful development. Um, I think from the talks today, we, we, uh, I'm convinced and, and, and from previous, but, and, and hopefully the folks in the room are as well, that this next plateau, this next level of, of gene therapies or, or, um, or ERTs is not likely to be uh, the, the end of the journey that, that, that we want. It's not likely, likely to provide the, um, the absolute outcome that, that I think that we really want to push for. So there's, there's, a, there's a next level beyond that, and, and hopefully these, these don't have another 10-year gap or 15-year gap in between. Um, and, but but I'm, I'm also unclear on what, what comes beyond that. I, I'm not sure how far away we are. Um, we've come so far and it's really exciting. Um, but there's still a lot about the disease and the mechanisms that we don't know. Um, everything that we're treating, chasing right now is, is effectively chasing clearing glycogen. Um, and, and we've got a bunch of really wonderful people that are researching the problem that have uh, posed new questions. And, and as we learn, we come up with new questions fast. So I think that there's going to be more to this story. Um, and that, that's, that doesn't scare me. Um, it doesn't make me feel hopeless. In fact, it makes me feel very hopeful that uh, that, that we get the chance to ask a lot of these questions and to understand the disease a lot more. Um, it also means that we're in a really pivotal time where our actions can matter. Um, which brings us to, to this next point, which is that prior success does not guarantee future success. Um, I'm, I'm nearly certain that, that what we have done so far does not, uh, it has not generated enough momentum to allow us to coast towards a, um, a, a, this, this sort of symptom-free future. Um, to this point, waiting for the next wave of heroes or heroes to show, uh, or individual heroes to show up is a bad strategy for us. Um, it, it, it's uh, yeah, just not likely to, to, to yield results in, our time, in the time frame that, that is important. Um, so we need to engage more people, um, which, which will make us less reliant on heroes, but it also has this added, added effect of, of making us more likely to find heroes. Um, so, so more people is an important part of the puzzle. Um, which brings us to the rare disease ecosystem. And, and this is certainly not a concept that I've come up with. Um, and, and we've heard uh, examples uh, today. So Amanda from Amicus mentioned, mentioned the, the, a whole team of folks working in different ways in advocacy, just, just in the pharma world um, over there. Uh, we know that from doctors, and, 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 and we've got a lot of support roles there. Uh, Dr. Komonis and Dr. Mosafar uh, mentioned a whole slew of disciplines within what we see as a, as a front-facing or a patient-facing doctor um, and skill sets that, that need to be covered. Um, and the font ends up pretty, pretty small, but, but we've got the neurologist, the geneticist, the pathologist, the cardiologist, the pulmonologist, all the hists that you can come up with. Um, and then we've got patients, which, which we, we know are, are obviously part of the ecosystem. Um, but then there's this, like, this, this whole additional layer behind the ones that are most obvious and most visible, um, that, are, that are in their own ways um, incredibly important. Um, so we've got uh, our families and our caregivers and, and, and the role that insurance plays and, and, and the support teams of the doctors and, and, and full credit to Dr. Mozafar um, for, for giving his team credit and, and, and appreciating the effort that goes into not just treatments but also understanding. Um, so there's, there's a whole team behind it that is both patient facing and, and also behind the scenes that, that we don't necessarily get to see. Um, we've got researchers and scientists working on this stuff, and, and these are biologists and chemists and engineers and, and biochemical engineers. A person couldn't make up their mind. Um, and, uh, and then we've got patient organizations, and, and I'm kind of, and, and it's tedious to go through all of these, but but it's an important thing that I want to, to point out, which is that um, there's a lot more people than than we necessarily see at face value uh, as our as our day to day going through our experiences with the disease, whether it's as a patient or as a, or as a doctor or as a researcher, there's a lot of people that, that choose to put their talents and their efforts into um, understanding and supporting uh, this area of growth. And so um, it's a really cool thing, it's a really important thing 
um, to, to, to recognize those and continue to appreciate those. And when we talk about growth of the ecosystem, also recognize the importance of, of these, these, these additional roles as well. So we've got patient organizations and advocates, and we've got trial coordinators, um, and all the support business, so, so any of the, the durable medical equipment or, or support devices that we experience. Um, uh, then we've, we've got policymakers, which we've touched on a little bit already, the newborn screening, and we'll, we'll touch on again here in a minute. Um, and then investors in pharmacies, and, and specialty pharmacists, because pharmacies aren't good enough to, to deal out uh, Lumazine, it needs to be a specialty pharmacist. Um, and then we've got journalists and news um, outlets to, to help tell our story and to carry our culture, um, and, and, and so on. So, uh, as you can kind of see, that the, 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 the ecosystem is quite a complex thing. And so, this is super wordy, sorry. I, 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 you'll, if you know me, you know that I get it this way. Um, I really struggled with this slide because I, I thought there must be some elegant way to, to display the relationships between all these different roles. And so I started laying it out, and I've, I've probably got 10 different versions of this slide that, that, that I went through, where I started out with the important roles, and then I tried to do like who is related to who, and then do like flowers and different <laughs> lines that crossed it, and it always ended up a mess. Um, so I left it as it is, and because uh, I couldn't figure it out. So, um, so, so I'm, I'm using it with words here. Uh, so the, the, there's, the, there's the visible roles and relationships, but, but then there's this whole interconnected system that is vitally important to the health of that ecosystem. Um, the roles between these variables is, is complex, um, and each one is contributing. Um, the existence of this ecosystem uh, it, it, it is a relatively new thing. It, it sort of tracks with that, at least it, as, as it relates to, to Pompeii disease and rare disease. Um, it sort of tracks with that with that timeline uh, cartoon that I showed on the on the on the other slide. Um, so the fact that we have any have an ecosystem and we have people filling all of these roles that, that even exist today feels like a win, and, 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 and it absolutely is. Um, but we can't lose focus on the purpose of our ecosystem. Um, and, and in my words, it's, it's an ambition and an aspiration that patients do not suffer from their disease. Um, and so to accomplish this, this purpose and to, to accomplish this goal, uh, we need to grow the ecosystem and improve its function in a, in a healthy way. Um, and, and we have some really specific examples that I was going to go through, and, and Dr. Mosmar gave some, some uh, even more specific examples, almost as if I paid him to tee it up. <laughs> um, so with this in mind, uh, I, don't, I personally don't see any other way uh, than to elevate the patient role uh, in the ecosystem um, and to, to make sure that it is center-focused. And, and this isn't to say that, that the other roles take a backseat to it. Um, it's that we, we make sure that we're keeping patients as, as the central and absolute central pillar. So um, we'll go into an example um, of, of, of how the ecosystem kind of works. Um, so newborn screening, as an example, and, and I'm glad that we picked this one. I was a little sad because some of the same data that, that was shown is data that I'm showing, um, but, but with a little bit of a different twist on it. So primary objective um, is, is essentially that since treatment is possible, um, in the, the, and the infantile onset form of the disease has a devastating progression, we should identify that as soon as possible, to start treatment as soon as possible, uh, to improve the, patient, the outcomes for patients. Um, and so this is, um, this is so, some, some impressions and highlights on that is that it's, it's overwhelmingly positive and really remarkable, the impact of newborn screening. Um, Taiwan uh, really gets like two or three gold stars for, for carrying the torch on this one. Um, they, they did their first large scale uh, uh, demo, if you will, or, or trial of, of uh, newborn screening in 2005. Um, and that, that 2005 to 2007 period, they covered about 45% of the, of the population of, uh, of births in Taiwan uh, with their newborn screening. Uh, and they learned a lot, and, 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 and Dr. Mosvar touched on some of this, because newborn screening, when we talk about it, it sounds like this singular thing that it, it maybe is easy. Um, it, it's absolutely not. Um, there, there's, there's a ton of complexity to it, and it's where do you draw the lines, and, and, and how do you uh, do tests and have fault and, and correct for false positives and false negatives and, and, and all these things. Um, sort of in, in, a, in a joking way, the, the, the old school version of newborn screening was have two kids, um, and, and if your first one has Pompeii, then you're then you're, you're hopefully ready for the second one. Um, but we can and and I say this not to be funny, but. The, the, the first literature on the effects of positive outcomes 
uh, from, from early access to treatment are from this exact scenario. Um, and, and I'm at the end of this and I can share it with folks. Is, uh, is I, I tried to pull some of the literature that, that supports what we're talking about today that is free and available in public domain for anybody that wants to dig deeper. Um, so, so this was a, um, a, a sibling pair in, in Japan um, that, 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 that had remarkable difference. And, and, and this kind of confirmed uh, something that was, was happening all over the, the world of Pompeii, uh, this, this concept that the earlier we access treatment, the better the outcomes might be. Um, and so, so with newborn screening and, and developing a technique, and, and, and we've got complicated versions now, so we've got tandem match uh, spectroscopy, and we've got digital microfluidics, and, and all of them are, are, are just to say that they're, they're more scientific ways, more precise ways of, of detecting it, and, and there's gonna be another more precise way beyond that. Uh, these ones aren't, aren't perfect, for sure. Um, but, the, but they're pretty great. Um, so they reduce, these, these, these improved techniques that are focused on it, it, reducing costs, improving accuracy, imp improving speed, um, and, and, and reducing the burden on patients. Um, and, and, and these patients, in this case, are, are non-diagnosed, uh, potentially have very healthy newborns. Um, and we've taken clinical, something that, that, that um, we used to only be able to diagnose on a clinical basis once there was, uh, uh, sort of the disease has already taken its course, uh, and that was happening on average in, in, in six to seven months for, for classic infantile onset um, with, as we've already talked about, the, the, the uncomfortable reality that, that uh, those children were, weren't seeing their first birthdays uh, in, in the absolute majority of cases and, and then certainly uh, in 100% of cases were not seeing their, their second birthdays. Um, but so we've taken diagnosis from months to days and, and that has unlocked a new paradigm for treatment um, and, and we've learned uh, that that has a positive influence. Uh, we've also had a chance to directionally test the positive influence of, 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 this, of this thought that faster, uh, faster access to treatment is, is important. Um, and so Taiwan, again, uh, leading the charge here, um, before 2010, uh, so after this initial screening and before 2010, uh, had an average time to, to from, from birth to treatment, uh, for, for positively diagnosed infantile onset Pompeii disease of, of 20, 21 days. Um, and then after 2010, they said, what if, what if we can do it even faster? And, and so after 2010, there's a cohort that is, has an average uh, access to treatment time of, of 11 days. Uh, and the, the difference between these two are not just clinically and statistically uh, significant. They are, they are uh, quality of life and, and impactful to family level significant. Um, so this is, this is some really, really amazing stuff that's happening out of, out of newborn screening um, that is only possible through newborn screening. So we have, we have uh, infantile onset patients that, that, are, that are getting treatment quick enough that are walking uh, in 11 months, which is dead center with where, 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 what that walking milestone should be. Um, they're, they're, they're achieving all their other developmental milestones um, as well as they should be as well. Um, one of the differences uh, between the 20-day group and the 10-day and the, um, the group is uh, it, it, there, there, there are some, some downstream few years later um, issues like that, that can develop like with hearing and, and, a, and a few other things. But, but certainly we're buying normalcy, whatever that means, for, for a few years for these families, which is, which is um, really important. Um, and this is where we start to, to disagree on interpretation, and, and, I, and I don't mean to say that in a combative way, I mean to say it in a way that, that this is a really important discussion to have, and, and it absolutely, absolutely needs to include patients, and it needs to include treating physicians, and it needs to include regulators. Um, and, and this is where, again, we elevate the patient goals. So my impression, and, and I told you I'd talk about speed throughout, is, is that we're moving super slow on newborn screening for something that is very obviously a good thing. Um, as of May 2018, we have, back to the US, we have 10 states that are live with newborn screening for Pompeii. Um, as mentioned earlier, California is now on board since then um, in, in starting it. And, and, and just because we're added to the rest and, and all these things, we are, it is not required in every state to screen for Pompeii. Um, this, is, this is up to each individual state's uh, interpretation of how to do it. Um, but uh, but that, that's, that's really slow. And, and to give a little bit of a context for the, for the speed, um, 
newborn screening was initially sub nominated for, for addition to the recommended newborn screening panel, the RUSP that we keep hearing about in, in uh, May of 2006, and it was denied for insufficient data. And then it was resubmitted in 2008, and it was denied for insufficient data. Uh, and finally, its resubmittal was uh, accepted. Uh, my notes here are cut off, which is why I keep on looking at the screen and hoping that I can will it to, to show me so I don't <laughs> misquote myself. But uh, uh, it was finally accepted to be resubmitted, to be reevaluated um, uh, in, in, I believe it was 2012, uh, and then eventually made it onto the RUSP in, in 2015. Uh, those last couple of dates, forgive me for being a year off on. Um, so this is, this is something that, that's moving really slow, and, and of course we have the hindsight now, right? Like, uh, we didn't have, in 2006, the data out of Taiwan comparing the 10-day the, the versus the 20-day the um, uh, uh, activation and treatment um, and the positive outcomes associated with that. We didn't have some of that. Um, but we, we do now, uh, and, and the fact that we still have uh, uh, one-fifth of our, our, our states um, uh, participating in this is, is a little bit a little bit tough for me to swallow. Um, when we talk about cost, the major thing that that, that, we're, that, we're, that is that, any, that anything can say, and uh, I think a lot of people say, but it's children's lives that we're talking about here. Cost shouldn't matter, and, and I don't disagree with that. But um, unfortunately, I'm a little bit more pragmatic, and, and so I, I do put enough weight into the cost side of things. Um, and I've not ran the numbers myself. I think I consider it a waste of time because it seems pretty obvious to me that um, access to treatment versus uh, the, the falling into the, to the cycle of advanced medical care is going to be cheaper. Um, at least, at least e even, even with the current ERT, which is really quite expensive, um, at an infantile doses, it's, it's, it's manageable just because it's, it's smaller and we've got uh, some, some adoption from, from the insurance side. But um, I think that, that, that the studies really quite clearly are, are favored towards this is actually a cost saving measure. Uh, not to mention the, the more important part, which is, is it, it is a life-saving measure. Um, so some of the same data that, that, that was presented earlier um, with, with one update, Missouri's since published, uh, uh, added some additional folks uh, to, the, to the chart that we showed earlier, so now we're up to 340,000. Um, so, so just to kind of put this to bed, because we, we've, we've all heard the, the one in 40,000 number, and quite honestly, this is still the number that, that people are quoting as if it is the, the, the con continues to be the, the current state of understanding, um, and it's, it's, it's wrong. Um, and we can say that confidently now. Um, it's a 20-year-old number. It was really clever the way that they came up with it when, when, when they did the folks at, at, at Erasmus uh, in the Netherlands. Um, they, we didn't have a, a good figure. It, it used to be thought that it was like around 1 in 100,000 um, incidence rate. So they took 3,000 something, 3,040 something, uh, Guthrie cards, bl uh, blood spot cards, and screened for three different mutations that they knew were common in their population to find the, uh, the, 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 the rates of carriers of these mutations, and then they used that to extrapolate how many, uh, how many, how many patients would be born with it. Um, so we can challenge the set of data all we want on newborn screening, and we can challenge the test methods, and we can challenge the accuracy uh, of the first level screening, which is just a GAA activity, uh, enzyme activity screening. Um, but uh, statistics really, they, they rely on, on power and sample size. So uh, we're, we're up to a uh, million and a half people in this sample set uh, that we're presenting here. And, and this is already a couple of years old data, right? A million and a half people, direct measurement of, 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 of whether they have Pompeii or not and which type um, versus a projection based on a, 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 a sample set that was um, sort of erroneous, erroneously small. Um, so this number here, one in 13,000, we've heard one in 14, one in and, and, and whatnot. Um, don't take it as, as the absolute rate, don't get it tattooed on your forehead for sure, but, uh, but it's more right than it is wrong and, and, and when, when somebody says one in 40,000, talk about correct them and, and move them to this number. Uh, it's not a matter of principle, it is a matter of importance uh, for, for how our future plays out. Um, and I show here uh, US numbers, just because uh, I know that we're, we're very patriotic over here, um, uh, and then also some global numbers. There's some really funny stuff, like Hungary has the, 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 the uh, most frequently occurring uh, group of Pompeii folks that you could ever imagine, and I don't think that this is true. I think it's, it's down to small, small sample size stuff. 
um, and, and the errors that you can get from collecting data only in a couple of years. If you have a pair of twins born immediately, you, you throw them off your numbers as an example. Uh, but, but at a cumulative level, you can, you can take these to be uh, at least the most correct form of uh, correct projections that we, that we have today. Um, and then one other thing just to, to reiterate, um, the, the, the rates uh, and comparisons of, of infantile and late onset um, tend to be around uh, yeah, that 25 to 28 percent infantile out of the, out of the group. So definitely it's the smaller amount, but, but um, for obvious reasons, uh, a super important group. Um, so, so continuing out of this example, we've already said that, that newborn screening had, it, had is very positive and directly successful on, on its intended mission, but it has this whole huge and important ripple effect on the ecosystem. Um, and, and, the, and the result of it is that we're not as rare as we think. Um, so, so how many patients are there in the room? Um, I guess by a raise of hands here. Fourteen. Fourteen. That guy's quick. Uh, so we got fourteen patients in the room, um, and, and, and so we would hope that, that everybody in, in Los Angeles is taking advantage, and even from outside areas is taking advantage of this great opportunity to meet meet other patients and to uh, hear from from. Uh, outstanding doctors and researchers that are, that are helping us. Um, but as we'll see in a second, it's really a pretty small amount. Um, and as we learned earlier from, from, uh, from Dr. Kimonis, that, that in the registry, globally, um, we're, we're sitting just under 2,000 uh, participants in the Pompeii registry. Uh, that is, that, that, that's owned by Genzyme. Uh, but when we take these, uh, these incidence rates and project them, and uh, the geneticists in the room will be quick to point out that this is not the correct thing to do. We're using incidence figures to, to project uh, prevalence, uh, which, which is admittedly incorrect. Um, the challenge is, is that for, for, for late onset, it's not that wrong. Um, the lifespan of, of, of the average eight, uh, adult onset patient or late onset patient um, suggests that, that, that this is a reasonable approach. Um, so these numbers, uh, again, don't get them tattooed on you. Don't, talk, don't, don't be mad at me if I'm, if I'm five or ten percent off. But the third, um, that it's sort of the purpose of, of, of starting the discussion. Um, so th these these are these are the figures for how many patients we should have if everybody was diagnosed worldwide. Um, again, order of magnitude figures, um, and then and then looking at sort of new members of the Pompeii family that that would be joining each year again assuming that the, 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 the incidence figures that we see uh, continue to be in that family. Um, so really, this is a, a meaningfully different number of people than we currently have. Um, so just to kind of frame a, a future slide here a little bit, um, to do a little bit of reference math for us, um, if we said that there was this hypothetical treatment that was uh, $100,000 per patient lifetime, which is a made-up number. My, my, my current treatment's uh, bordering on, on, on a million a year. Um, gotta love good insurance. Um, <laughs> and and uh, so if we said 100,000 per patient, lifetime, and we reached 100% of those people, um, that'd, be, that'd be a business case or an opportunity of, of $56 billion uh, with a recurring benefit or opportunity of $1 billion per year uh, for patients for. Now this is like completely hypothetical, but just to put some, some numbers in our minds, because they do matter. Um, and then, yeah, just we'll keep an eye on, on this rate here, 49 new uh, uh, infantile uh, onset patients per year in the US is what we should expect going forward, um, thereabouts, and, and 2000, a little over 2,000 worldwide going forward. Again, if they're all diagnosed with, with newborn screening, we should get them. Uh, and then, yeah, the figure is 8,000 new people, 7,500 new people for, for late onset. Um, so, so going back to the ecosystem impact, because that was the important part here, is uh, that newborn screening saves lives and improves the outcome for, for patients and families, and that's a direct positive uh, impact. Um, it also helps us to recruit, and this is one of the things that, that um, I'm abs I absolutely understand the, the argument against newborn screening on the, on, on the grounds that for the majority of the people that we're catching, 
with our current methods for newborn screening, 72% uh, of those people uh, are gonna be adult onset. Um, we're, we're potentially causing them to worry about something uh, at a time when your anxiety is already high anyway, having, having, having a new child, uh, causing them to worry about something that, that they may not have to worry about for some years. Um, I, I'm not aware of the data suggesting that that time frame is 20 to 30 years. Um, I think that, that where that comes from, uh, for, for when we're talking about the, the age of onset, average age of onset of symptoms for, for adult patients, I think that that's an artifact of, of the way we currently diagnose. Um, I was diagnosed at 30, so I like uh, 29, but it's 30. I can't do math apparently, that's why I need to have it on here. Um, the, so, so I fit like right in that ballpark. But, but I've had symptoms since I was a kid. And, and when we look at the data that, that suggests when, that, that, that tells us about when uh, adult patients are getting diagnosed, it says that they're getting a diagnosed at, at an average age of like 35 with an onset of symptoms 10 years before that. But this is a patient saying, yeah, I think I felt weaker then. Um, so it's, it's, not a, it's not a very scientific way to say that the onset of symptoms had occurred. Um, so I, I, I don't put a lot of stock into that figure. Um, and, and even if we do, uh, I think that we're, we're, we're losing ourselves in the weeds of the thing. And, and absolute credit to the roles that, and, and, and we're going back to the ecosystem part of it, right? Different roles have different perspectives and it's really important that they do. We need to have these different roles in the society. We can't have a, 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 a collective and singular thought process in that, in, in that ecosystem. Um, it, it wouldn't work. Um, but we've got researchers who are playing an important role in, 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 the, in the ecosystem that, that favor uh, precision um, and correctness over efficacy. And that's a really important thing, and, and I wouldn't want them to be any other way. Um, the, the feeling of telling a patient that, that they have to worry about something when they really don't is, is, is not something that, that, that you want to do if you, you, you have the potential to do harm. Um, but, but I don't think that we should address the uncertainty with, with newborn screening as an example by dragging our feet around it. There's absolutely gonna be problems that we're gonna run into and, and uh, if, if my cartoon is anywhere near correct, um, I believe that we're gonna run into some other learnings and educations and, and opportunities and challenges as we go through the rest of, uh, of, of this Pompeii journey. Um, we're gonna learn new things and we can't let the fear of learning those new things slow down our progress now. We should run headfirst into those and then, and then address them as we do um, and collect data on, on, on them to describe them. Um, so, uh, yeah, the, 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 there's another important part that, that, that we were right on or that, or that I completely agree with, with, with Dr. Mozapar on, which is that um, our current landscape is not equipped to deal with these kinds of numbers that we're generating. Um, there are not enough knowledgeable physicians, there are not enough knowledgeable geneticists, there are not enough, uh, there's not enough uh, production capacity in, 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 the, uh, in, the, in the industry partners that we've got to, to address this. Um, but we can, we, can, we, can, we can tackle those problems with, with the benefits that we've gained from newborn screening. So we've got an opportunity to get more data and really significantly cleaner data. So better science equals a, a faster pace of progress. Um, we don't have to look at all these charts that you have to have a PhD, quite literally, to understand um, and to try to like look at with your head turned sideways to try to draw a trend out of. Um, I, I've met a lot of patients and, and uh, in the level of intelligence amongst the patient population is certainly more than sufficient to, uh, to participate in, in this part of the, of the disease. Um, we just, we, we need to make the, the, the data better so that it's, uh, it's, it's more easily interpreted. Um, expanded reach of newborn screening attracts new and diversified talent. Um, so we said that there's, there's 400,000 something folks in the world that should have Pompeii disease and we have 2,000 of them plus or minus 5,000 if you really want it, so, just so that nobody argues with me about, about who's participating in the registry. But we, we've got 99% of our people that are, not, that are not captured and that are not participating in the ecosystem right now. Um, and the, the, my interpretation of, that, of this is because they, they aren't severely affected. They're folks that are, that are out there um, in, in, in the working force and, 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 and doing things um, and have, that have developed different talents because they, they have not had to, to sort of had, have their time sucked away from them to, to worry about this disease. So we've got um, lawyers and researchers and, and artists and, and web designers and, and, and 
and counselors and, and all these folks that are in this eco that that have this connection to us that, that just haven't been tapped into yet that can really help the ecosystem and the health of the ecosystem. Um, we're, we're increasing the fundraising opportunity. Um, so, so more projects with better execution uh, through, 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 through good funding. Um, and then we've got new economics that are even more attractive in this case. Um, I think that it, 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 it's pretty clear that, that Genzyme does well and has made, and, and full credit to them, they, 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 they took a lot of risks early on to participate in this business opportunity. But they've done well enough that it's inspired nine other people to get into a disease that they thought when they were getting into it only affected one out of every 40,000 people. Um, the, the economics are there. So if we have now 100 times more patients, uh, it, 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 it's certainly even that much more attractive. So we can't lose sight of that, that, that there is a business role to play here, but, but fortunately for us, uh, newborn screening actually uh, solidifies that, that, that as an opportunity. Um, one of the things that, that isn't uh, uh, listed on here, but I think is an important one, um, I don't know the right answer on, 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 on how, uh, what the psychological impact of, of learning that you have a disease or that your child that's a couple days old now has a disease that may come and get them in five to 50 years. Um, I, I don't underestimate the, the, the negative that can come with that. Um, I know that from, from my experience and from, from my mentality and I, and I think from, from another, a number of folks in the room, um, if you had the opportunity to participate as early as possible to help your current state um, or to look at the next patient coming up behind you as, as, as a different version of yourself and you had the, the opportunity to help them out by participating now, um, I'm not saying that everybody would take it and I'm not saying that I would judge the people that don't. But out of out of out of eight thousand new people a year, I bet some of them would. I bet some of their parents would, and their, and their brothers and their sisters and their and their, and their coworkers and, and so on. So um, to to deny the, the merits of newborn screening, even on the grounds of, of uh, adult onset or late onset Pompe disease, I think that there's a serious discussion that, that, that needs to be happened there to happen there that considers um, the long term effects of, of of the psychology associated with it. Um, and then coming back to this, to this, this theme that, that we keep beating the drum of, our probability of success increases with ecosystem growth. Um, again, we can't, um, our, our goal is not to find like the next singular bright doctor, the next um, singular bright researcher and, 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 and overload them. Uh, we're, we're, we're much better to, to crowdsource this issue, uh, to use a, a popular term now, right? Um, and with newborn screening, we've tar we have targeted crowdsourcing, which is really like every advertiser's you know, absolute dream. Um, we know who the one in 13,000 people are that care the most, and the only people that care more than them are their parents, and we know who they are too, and we know who their siblings are, and their friends are, and their families are, and their coworkers, and so on. Um, we're gonna find new cases of parents that, that didn't know that they had disease, as David mentioned earlier. Um, we're gonna find participants, so, uh, so, so newborn screening is, is hugely important and impactful uh, for, for more than just saving the lives and, 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 and bringing uh, hope to, to infantile onset. It's, it's, it's really uh, a critical piece of the entire ecosystem puzzle. So where do we go from here? Um, how do we improve the function and the rate of, of growth for our ecosystem? And these, these last few slides are, are my perspective, they're, they're a little bit less formatted um, and really meant more as a discussion because I can't, I'm not the one that, that gets to decide all this. It's, it's it, in fact, what I'm proposing is that um, we as a patient population um, participate uh, a bit more with um, all the, the wonderful other members of our ecosystem to, 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 to have great dialogue and action towards achieving this growth. So first of the things is we need to build the team, and I've said this a few times before, so we can picture how that happens. Um, we need to engage an entrepreneurial spirit and get organized and build the machine uh, so that we can st sustain a continued growth. Um, and, and what I really mean by the entrepreneurial spirit here is, is bringing some creativity and, and willingness to um, take risks and, and, and potentially fail just for the, for the sake of learning. Um, uh, I can say this, I guess, for, for 
for myself and, and, and hopefully, again, not for every late onset patient, but certainly a subset of them will have the attitude of, I, I, can, I can afford to, 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 to lose a little bit to make progress. So I can, I can take a little bit of risk to make, to make progress faster to help out uh, my future self or, or, or my friends that I've made through this community or, or the next person coming along that, that's just like me. Um, so, so that's what I mean, it's, it's getting creative and, 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 and being innovative about how we approach the problem. Uh, uh, we're also sort of, we have this benefit of, of our rich history with this disease and, and it, again, um, I'm excited about it and, and, and one of the reasons is because I've, I've seen and, and read up on, on what folks have done that, that have come before um, and participated in, and, 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 and David had a, had a ringside seat and, part, and participated um, in, in, the, in the 90s through, through this and, and continues to do so today. Um, and, and, and so, and so to, to the researchers and the doctors that we've, that we've got in the room and, and, and the geneticists. Um, so I, I only kind of get to read about these stories and, and hear about them the way that, that you, might, uh, you might hear about this, read, read a comic or, or something like that and, and then be amazed. Um, but it's so super interesting and, and really wonderful. Um, we also have the benefit of, of, of accessibility of information and peer learning. Um, there's a lot of groups who actually took cues from the original Pompeii efforts um, in their rare diseases and, and have applied some new organization and, and, and execution techniques um, to varying degrees of success. So we get we get to we get to learn from from a from a, a more developed landscape. Um, we also have a lot more people. We just said that newborn screening helps us get a lot more people. So like this is finding people who are who are motivated is not our, our concern anymore. Uh, actually getting them uh, to to know that they can contribute is, is where we can we can do something. Um, and and we've got a compelling business case. Um, so our 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 probability of, of success improves with ecosystem growth. growth. Um, so we need to actively improve the, the health and the size of our ecosystem. Um, it also means that the opposite is true, or, or I, I would suggest the opposite is true. Uh, if, we, if we only draw from it, um, the pace and the productivity of that ecosystem is going to decline over time. Um, and some would argue that, that, that that's something that we're experiencing right now. Um, in, 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 in the pace of progress uh, with respect to when we first had uh, uh, ERT and, and this life-saving uh, uh, drug. Um, so really, mo most importantly, because I said, uh, power, uh, uh, patients need to play, play a big role here. Uh, uh, I want to talk about empowered patient roles. Um, so the important thing here is, is activating patients into participants, advocates, and leaders. Um, and a quick aside, again, because uh, uh, apparently I like hearing myself. Um, Powered patience is not a novel concept. This isn't something that's like new or, or, or that, that there's any credit to. Um, in fact, it's the specific thing that got us here in the first place. Um, got a Dutch flag there because uh, our, our story doesn't exist. Our progress, our, 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 our um, health does not exist without the, the contributions of, of uh, Dutch researchers, Dutch patient groups, early organization in those ways. It's really some, some incredibly selfless uh, acts that had patients first. Um, we can also recall that the first global meetings of the minds, the, the first time that we got experts in Pompeii from around the world together in the same room to discuss topics and to ask questions like, like Dr. Komonis did of, of, of Dr. Koval and, 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 and Dr. Byrne and, and have this dialogue to, to progress our understanding of the disease um, happened because it, it, the, the concept was conceived and executed by a patient family and that was the, the, the first AMDA conference. Um, we also can, can recall the profoundly positive impact of patient relationships. And again, the important part here is it's not patients often doing it on their own. It's, it's just taking um, an active role in the ecosystem. Um, that, that patient relationships, both personal and professional, had on, um, on exciting the very best quality of work and, and, and humanity and researchers. Um, one, one example of this is, is uh, Dr. Arnold Reuser in, in the Netherlands at Erasmus. If you don't know his name as a, as a patient, uh, he's, he's, he's one of the icons of our sport, if you will. Uh, he, he was, the, in his lab, he and his team were the first to, to, to clone um, the, the GAA enzyme. And, and 
which would provide a potentially a huge opportunity to monetize that uh, into treatments and so on and so forth. Um, and the very first thing that he did was uh, uh, gave it off to uh, some some competitive some, some competing researchers uh, at Duke University and, and, and in Australia. Um, that's humanity. That's that's. That's putting the patient first and, 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 and saying, hey, I want to be competitive, I want to help people, um, but my motives for, for personal success are not greater than my motives to help people. Um, and again, this is a really important one, and I'm not saying that we necessarily lost our place in that, but... Um, so so in, in, in general, I'm inspired by the sense of adventure and accomplishment undertaken by these pioneers. Um, and I say adventure, which, which sort of connotates as having fun while doing this, and. And I do, and I think that there's a way to do it that we can all have a lot of fun. And I'm not saying that we're not going to have our hard days and our challenges, but um, a community coming together and achieving results is, is, is like the most fun I can, thing I can possibly think of, um, and, and helping and helping our fellow uh, uh, patients and, and, and families. So uh, adventure and, and, and finding the fun in this is, is, is another important part of motivating. Um, and I said this, and this is like a really wordy, backwards way to say it. Um, so I'm not, I'm not saying that we've lost our way. Um, I think the scope of the opportunity has outpaced our ability to keep, keep up with it and captain the ship. So where we had uh, a, a very prominent patient uh, experience in getting that first that first level of progress on the cartoon that, that I shared earlier, um, we've I, I think that that perhaps the, the role of the patient has has taken a little bit uh, of, of, a, of a dimmer light. Uh, of late, um, but but that's okay. Uh, heroes can't continue to, to provide you know that level of effort and exert that level of energy 100% of the time. Um, so we're really at a fortunate place that, that, that uniquely at this moment in time we're primed with the lessons that we've learned from from that first um, uh, I guess wave of progress uh, and with the paradigm shift in opportunity both in uh, patient numbers and, and opportunities to contribute, as well as the business case, um, to, to motivate us to re-energize this concept in some specific ways. Um, uh, oh, <laughs> this is, I added this last one. The, the other reason why I think patients, and I think most of the folks from, from representing pharma here will, will know, know this is very true of me, um, I think we can get away with a lot more than they can. There's there's a lot of uh, red tape and, and and proper procedure that must be followed. Um, that that I understand why it's there, but it's really gone quite too far uh, from a risk aversion perspective. Um, if we are all as patients in a room or in a community saying that we want this uh, and it is our information, um, it should be something that happens very quickly, not something that takes very long and has to be mediated through four other third parties to get there. So. Uh, <laughs> this is this is uh, funny. It tells you something about my spirit, but but it's also um, I think a, 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 an actual important point that we can get away with a lot more than anybody else. Um, so talking about patients as participants, and these next these these, these three slides are um, concept ideas. They're they're, they're essentially uh, basically meant to initiate a brainstorm of how we can uh, take more active roles. Um, one of the things that I think is important is we need to become collaborators and not subjects. And it was only two days ago that I realized I was sensitive to becoming that, that I was sensitive to every piece of literature that refers to patients as subjects. Um, and it, it just like it, it happened. It happened overnight. Um, it actually happened in the course of a, a, a paragraph. I was bothered in the first paragraph. I was really bothered by the third paragraph, and, and wrote a, a whole thing uh, to, to that particular pharmaceutical company to. Um, to try to encourage them to change their, their vernacular. Um, this is an important part of us playing our role, and, 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 and the language that we use for, for our culture is, is, is an important one. Um, that those subtleties uh, uh, should not be overlooked. Um, so when we talk about trials, um, when we talk about patient burden, and, and I hear a lot of uh, patients talking about the, 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 the obstacles that are associated with participating in trials, and I hear a lot of pharmaceutical companies um, talking about we need to do everything that we can to reduce the patient burden. Um, I have sympathy and frustration when I hear about it, and, and, and I, I've, it's been suggested to me by, by multiple people that I should not put on the slide that I have frustra frustration with the patient burden because uh, it sends the wrong message, so I, I relented and put that small uh, asterisk there. 
Uh, my frustration is not with patients, not individual patients. Um, it, it's, it's, the, it's the state that we're in that um, both sides are, are sort of making compromises for, for how quickly we can progress because the, the burden is absolutely real. Um, but, but I look at it from a slightly different perspective. Um, and, and it's a little bit wordy to get out, but because but, I am not good at speaking concisely. Um, but I view that, that this disease is a burden, and that burden will grow and accumulate uh, in, in, in the disease taking its natural course. So if we do nothing, uh, we will incur this burden. That is 100% true. Um, there's, there's, there's zero chance that we're going to avoid that burden. Um, but if we do something, there will be a cost, there will be a burden to us. Um, but through that, we can prevent the future burden of the natural course, whether it be directly for us or figuratively for us, as in the next, um, the next wave of patients. Um, then, then, then we can really sort of, that's the only way that we can over time reduce the patient burden. Um, weak or slow science, weak or slow science is the more detrimental burden. Um, and and, and uh, you know, any any anybody who's ever dealt with fidelity can tell you, can can recall any of their kicks about retirement accounts and needing to put in early to, to get the benefit later and so on. And this is sort of somehow a relevant analogy. So with with trials, I propose uh, a simplified decision tree on whether you participate. Um, and I wish Jared was here because uh, last year he gave a talk that gave some different perspectives on. Uh, on trials. Trials does not mean that you walk into a lab and, and you get poked with a needle um, and, and some new drug that might cause you to grow a new limb or, or vomit or do something like that uh, is, is going to be hap happening to you. Um, there are those two, but, but, but there are trials that um, I was talking with David. I, I did the, one of the first trials that I did, uh, I did from literally, quite literally from my couch. Um, it was a, a blood spot sent off to uh, a university in Germany that, that uh, is researching new ways, better ways uh, to do Pompeii uh, newborn screening uh, and positive diagnosis and cheaper and faster methods. Um, I've done trials where you can, where, where, where it's an ultrasound essentially, uh, and it's a one day thing, and, uh, and, and it's ways to try to find non invasive um, diagnostic tools for muscle strength and mus muscle effectivity. I've done the invasive versions of those too, where they stick um, electrodes into your shin uh, two or three inches deep and, and try to stimulate the muscle tissue or the muscle fiber to see if it responds the way that it should. Um, those, those are less pleasant for sure. Uh, but, 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 but hopefully uh, those examples can, can, can provide the, 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 the new vision that trial doesn't mean that you're a guinea pig. Um, trial can mean lots of different things and, and they can mean different things for different people, but it does mean that you are participating in advancing the state of understanding and advancing the state of, of treatment for uh, the disease. So decision tree, proposed decision tree is, um, should I participate? Your default answer should be yes. Um, is it, is it, then the modifier should be there. Is it a low number of visits? Yes. Is it, so then I'm saying it. Is it, a, a is it close to me or easy to do? Yes. Are there potential negative impacts? Then I'll think about it. Um, there's other things that come into it, right? There's, there's, but, but, but simplify the decision tree. Have a default um, perspective that, that I'm going to participate in this. And, and then you can do it on your own terms. I'm not, I'm certainly, uh, uh, would want to protect against judging people based on, uh, you know, somebody is, is better because they chopped off their arm for, in the name of Pompeii versus somebody that only walked uh, for somebody with a timer for six minutes. Um, there's enough of us in this new paradigm, in this new world of Pompeii that, that, that if we can each participate in a very small way or even a, a percentage of us can participate in a very small way, we can have a hugely meaningful impact and accelerating phase of progress. Other ways that we can be participants is, is, is learning, um, getting educated and, and, and going to conferences, and participating in conferences and, and having um, discussions with, with our local doctors, with, with other rare disease patients, with, um, with our communities for awareness. These, these are all uh, forms of participating. Um, fundraising, and I put our money in here because on the next slide I'm gonna talk about other people's money. Um, there's a, there, 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 there are a number of people who have given a lot of money um, either directly out of their own pocket or have, through great effort of theirs, found other people to, to give money to support our causes. Um, we all had, had, had a steak lunch uh, as an example of, of one way that, that fundraising has helped uh, or, or fundraising contributes to the overall ecosystem. 
Um, the good news is much like the, the, the role of, of carrying the weight uh, of that boulder up the, up the mountain, um, we've got a lot more people now, so like, you know, that whole crowdsourcing thing, if we, can, if we can get everybody to give a dollar, then we don't need the, 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 the individual families to give a million. Um, but we should still encourage them to do that too. Um, and then mentoring and teaching and supporting, so participating in, in the roles of, of lives of, of other patients. Um, we saw on the slide earlier, we're gonna have, uh, what did I say, 49 new, new uh, infantile onset patients in the US every year. So we're gonna have uh, 100 new parents that are scared that their whole world is crashing down around them. That, that, that could use somebody to, to, to help them to understand how to, how to move forward. Um, there's adults that are, that, are, that are gonna start experiencing symptoms and, and, and they're gonna get to the, to the age where, um, you know, the, the, the fact that they, they, they walk a little bit funny or that they're on a ventilator or that they have all these things are gonna be a direct conflict with their, with their desire to fit in or to, um, to, 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 to go dating or do anything. Um, mentors can help, help people through those those challenges. Uh, they can also do some very practical things like, hey, who do I call if, if I need a better BiPAP or if I need new supplies or if I want to challenge my insurance? Uh, so th these are important ways that we can participate um, and, and, and that don't necessarily give anything of your, of your body or of your, of your health. Um, I, I would actually argue that you probably get a, a much improved health out of participating as a mentor. Uh, uh, and, and then the role that the, that the, of the person that you're helping is, is, is really uh, an appreciative role as well. Um, so then, then patients as advocates. Um, so, so newborn screening is, is a super great example of, of the power of, of patient advocacy. Um, we managed much, much to, 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 to grumpy old man Mozakars over there's a, a chagrin. We managed to uh, get newborn screening approved without uh, figuring out all the problems that were going to come from it. Um, I think that's a good thing. I understand why it's a bad thing, but but this is a, it, one way or the other. You have to kind of take it as a, an example of patient's power in, in an advocacy role. It didn't happen fast, though, and it certainly didn't happen without without a significant amount of effort. Um, and I wish Sabrina was still here, but she she participated in a lot of that too um, to, to help describe it firsthand for folks after afterwards. Um, but so that that's that's. Uh, pro-patient policy kind of stuff. Um, talking about education, accuracy of information. Um, uh, this, this is a really important one. Um, so we, we can advocate for correct information. I think it's wonderful that we have uh, Facebook groups and, 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 and social media to connect all of us. I cringe every time uh, there is inaccurate information being spread. And it's not that I know everything, I, 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 I know very little. Um, but uh, normally the things that I get, that I cringe about are things that I often was wrong about before and got corrected. So I'm, I'm hyper aware of them. And, and I think um, getting accurate educational uh, uh, information and experience out there is, is vitally important for uh, sort of the efficiency of our emotions going through this whole journey. Um, I want to hold uh, doctors and hospitals and insurance companies to be accountable. Um, I think some of us in the room have had experiences where, where, where um, the doctor didn't give us enough time for all the questions that we've had, or we didn't get the testing done fast enough that, that, that we wanted to while we're understanding things. Um, these are ways that we can, we can hold people accountable, and we know certainly uh, with our disease that, that time does, does matter. And so the, the difference between a week or a month, maybe not, in, in the adult onset case, um, but the cumulative effect of accepting week-long delays and month-long delays over, over the entire ecosystem uh, has, has a, a decades-long effect in delaying progress. Um, equipment providers, manufacturers, and designers. Um, I said that our, our goal is that, that people are not, do not suffer from their disease uh, at some point in the future, but, but currently we do. Um, how, do we, how do we get better, better, better equipment um, to help us breathe at night, to help us get around mobility um, at, at different stages of our, of our progression? Um, how, do, how, do we, how do we advocate for, for improvements along, along those routes, and then also costs associated with it? Um, Talk about um, uh, pro-patient policy. This one is, we talk about our own money. Um, now we're talking about allocation of government and private sector funds. But how do we get, how do we get Genzyme to, to, to invest even more money? How do we get amicus and, and our dentists to get more money or help them to get investors from, for, for, to, to fund their science? 
um, through, through uh, grants or, or funds from, from private sector. Um, the most impressive example I have of this, and, and I think it was M it's MPS1, maybe someone can correct me here, that managed to get a uh, DOD budget allocated towards their rare disease. That's pretty sweet. I mean, I don't know how the far end of defense uh, budget is best spent there, uh, but I'm not mad at them. I'm definitely not mad at them. There's a lot of money that goes to the DOD. So uh, the opportunities are certainly there. Uh, and, and, and within this activated ecosystem, there's definitely people that are far better and far more creative and imaginative than I for how to get somebody to, uh, to part with, a, with their dollar. Uh, and and we, need, we need those people. Um, and, then, and then how do we advocate? Um, this is, I guess, sort of more of a personal note um, for the everyday treatment of people and, and, and patients. So either at work or at school or walking down the street, so whether they have Pompeii or not, how do we, how do we bring kindness to, to folks around us? Um, so these are things that we can do every day uh, uh, as advocates. Um, and then th this last one is one that, that I'm, I'm particularly passionate about, which is patience as leaders. Um, if you agree that we need to grow the ecosystem to have success, I can't think of anybody that should be more motivated than us. Um, I, 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 and, if, and, if, and if we are not motivated, we really need to take a look in the mirror because uh, there's no reason our lives are on the line, right? And our, and our health is on the line. Um, that's more important than the, than, the, than the dollar signs and the business opportunity. So we should be the most motivated. So, uh, so, so we should, that, that motivation should, should feed into our leadership. So one of the things that I think is really important is, is defining our culture and buying into it. And I'm not talking about fragmented groups of patients, which is sort of how we, we feel a little bit at the moment, uh, uh, but, but, but it's sort of a, a, an overall patient representation. So prioritizing patient interests uh, in our culture, um, having, having a sense of altruism and, and inclusive nature in our culture and, and, and improving things. Um, one of the, the, the great examples that, that we've had on this and, and folks um, had, it, we've had in various discussions from, from like the inclusivity part uh, is to, to participate in any of these trials, you need to be uh, the, the right age and ambulatory and, and like a little bit affected, but not like super affected. Um, and, and Dr. Rosenbar really highlighted some, some of the, the key problems with that. Um, what it also what it, what it means is yes, we're, we're potentially addressing the biggest customer in this market because we said adult onset patients are the, 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 the preponderance of patients, but we're not helping the ones that are in the most need. Um, and and that, that, that that's something that, that we should do as uh, for, for our sense of humanity. We should also do it for the sense of the challenge to the science. Um, these are the people that can most benefit, and perhaps that the benefit of a truly effective uh, treatment uh, would have the most positive and profound effect on. Um, the same way that we had this positive and profound effect on, on infantile patients when they were the, the first folks uh, to go on, undergo the, uh, the, the trials of, of the original ERT. Um, you could look at a chest x-ray and see uh, the cardiomegaly, the, the, the enlarged hearts, shrinking in, in, a, in a relatively short period of time. Like, this is, absolutely and clearly just demonstrative. If I can walk three meters feet or faster or further in six minutes, I can't, I, 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 I can do that with different shoes on um, or, or if there's a rug on the carpet uh, or if there's a rug it's sort of, as opposed to a, a hard floor that, that, that causes me to drag my feet. Um, these are not the, like, it, it, these are not principles of inclusion and they're, 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 they're bad, for, bad for patients and they're also bad for science. Um, so we, 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 as leaders, we would get to define that and play a more active role in it. Um, the way we accomplish this is getting, getting a bit more organized. And again, this is at a, at a global and local level. So uh, both with our events and our resources and, our, and, our, and, and formalizing our mentorship program, et cetera, um, working on in information and education for patients and families and, 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 and doctors, because we already said that, that from a doctor's perspective and from a patient's perspective that, that our current um, system is not prepared for this number of patients. Um, I, I, I've dealt with a lot of doctors and have friends that are doctors that, that don't like say, Pompey, I, I think I heard about that once in med school. Um, so how do, we, how, do we, how do we make this a lot more, uh, a lot more common of a disease for them to know what to do with um, and, and do it in the right way so that, that patients don't have to travel across to Duke to, to get support or travel over to Florida to get support. Um, fortunately, we have, we have the efforts at Irvine to make it closer for us, but, but that's three sites that, that are 
arguably the, the, the predominant centers in the U.S. Um, that that doesn't, certainly, certainly doesn't cover the patients that, 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 that exist. Um, fundraising and allocation of those funds. Um, so, so there's lots of different ways to spend money. Um, patient education, uh, patient interaction with, with pharmaceuticals and, and with researchers is, is an important one, but, but funding the research in and of itself is, is another way that we can, we can participate, or providing uh, seed money for, 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 a, for a med student, to, to, which is relatively cheap, to, to uh, work on Pompeii because, hey, they, we were the ones that gave them money and data, uh, and, and once you know it, that talented person is more likely to go into the next phase of their career interested in Pompeii because it's the only thing they know. And now we've expanded the ecosystem that way. Um, there's lots of different ways for fundraising and allocation and a lot of this is that, that entrepreneurial and creative spirit that um, can, can really come in in, a, in the most obvious way. Um, one of the other really important parts of, of uh, getting organized is a patient-owned and independent registry. Um, uh, we are so fortunate and, and, and like, Rare Disease 101, Disease 101 is the first step you do is start a registry. Find, find out who else is like you out there. Start to collect information. This is the information that you're gonna to need to understand for yourself uh, and, and also to, uh, to, to, to support the research. Um, we're very fortunate that, that uh, this data collection and, and storage can, can be an expensive task that we've got Genzyme that, that undertook that task for us. Um, and they've, I, I think, in, in many ways, uh, recognized the potential conflict of interest here and, and tried to um, deconflict it by putting in place measures that, that, that separate the business side from, from the patient side. Um, as time goes on, the ability to maintain that separation uh, becomes harder and harder to, to, to meaningfully achieve. So I think now that we have this whole new group of people coming on, we're only got less than 1% of the Pompeii people in the registry anyway. Uh, like, you know, independent registry that, that we, can, we can use uh, that has patient-owned data is, is really important. Um, and then engaging partners. So overall, as leaders, we can stimulate the ecosystem. And that's a, that's a really part, important part of our progress. Um, and, and with that, I, I think I'm, I'm done and I've rambled on enough. Uh, thank you for, for hearing me out. Um, I'm happy to, to chat about any of this or share any of the information or, or more details about my journey with anybody who's interested. Thanks. Yes, sir. Just for, the, for everybody else's awareness, most states have one central site or, 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 or very few. This is like a common thing to, to centralize the uh, physical location and, and procedures for testing uh, these, these blood spot cards. No, these are actually the sites where the families go in to receive their results. Oh, okay. Sorry, okay. I misinterpreted that. Not the testing laboratory that does the tandem aspect. It's actually the sites that receive all the referrals from any 
pediatrician that is doing an eel stick is only seven sites in the entire state. That's the first thing. The second thing is that although I understand the challenges of diagnosing an adult onset disease in the newborn period, there's tons of data in the literature as to the psychological impact of being diagnosed with the BRCA gene before you develop breast cancer, Parkinson's gene before Parkinson's actually presents itself, the Huntington's Korea gene before it presents itself. So you can look to that. Alzheimer's as well. Yeah, Alzheimer's as well. So you can look to those disease paradigms and how they manage the psychological impact and the necessity for pulsing in those cases, and potentially apply it to the adult onset cases. Yeah, I think, I think those, are, those are two great uh, contributions that, that, and good points. Uh, so, yeah, perhaps like that's something that, that, that we can work on, and I don't know where David went. Bless you. But uh, as we organize, we can. He's behind you. Sneaky. Maybe he's doing that thing. Yeah, uh, yeah I, think, I think those are those are two important things for, for, for the, uh, an organized community to, to go work on that, that we can participate in. Thanks. Okay, we have one more short presentation. I'd like to